Hello, and welcome to my show, Searching for Integrity. My name really is John Smith, and I'm searching for people with integrity. Why? Because our country suffers from IDD, Integrity Deficit Disorder. Today, we have a, a doctor and an author, Dr. Stephen M. Cohn, MD, for, geez, a long time, 40 years. I would, uh, that's a long time, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but you sure have come through with it pretty well, pretty well. And the book, you brought your book, great, prime. All breeding, bleeding stops. Life and death in the trauma unit. Uh, I gave this book a, a lot of attention here because I couldn't put it down. So that's, that's good. good that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, let's start with you. Okay. Do you think that um, um, this is the time that you've done it? Have you started it on it? Well, when did you finally say, I'm going to do it this time? Write a book? Or... Yes. Yes. So about um, about the fall of fall of 2021, um, after COVID, I, I took a little time and uh, wrote the book. It actually sort of poured out onto the page. Uh, the biggest problem I had was each time I thought of a of a interesting story to tell, um, I thought of three other ones as I was writing that one. And so I the, the list kept getting longer and longer, and I was uh, eventually kind of caught up to it. And uh, and then once I had uh, these all these different uh, kind of Ill illuminating tales written down, then I then it took a, a little while to put them all together. Um, after that was sort of a new experience for me to go find a literary agent. I'd written many um, textbooks in at the academic press, but I'd never right. done anything for the lay public. So I had to go find a literary agent and I found an, an excellent one. And then he uh, uh, guided me through the process of writing a book proposal, which took about as, you know, a couple of months actually. And then, uh, you know, that's kind of a book about your book. <laughs> And yeah. then, uh, and then that went off to some publishers, and one of them picked it up two weeks later, and and then since then it's just been the kind of fine tuning. But uh, so really, the process was very short and quick, and uh, I've been very pleased with it, and uh, um, I'm glad that people have seemingly enjoyed the book and wanted to see it in print. Well, the the reviews say that and and those are great and makes me th makes me thinking I'm, i can't wait for the next page and i don't have the next page so. <laughs> <laughs> sorry um, about that next well, that's all right it's where they want to put it it's, it's got to be the moon's right you know whenever they launch it <laughs> yeah true um i learned a lot more this and uh, i appreciate it your service because I, I spent a, a year in Vietnam once upon a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have with uh, 40, 40 years, four, four decades, um, that's, uh, geez, you're probably, if you don't mind, you're probably in your 60s. Correct. Very good. I turned 75 two months Congratulations. ago. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> and, uh, it's uh it's it's quite a task. I wrote a book, uh, same as you. Are you going to call it as a memoir? Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. it... my mine is not a memoir. I very my this particular book was designed to not really be about me as much as about what I was trying to accomplish in the field. And but it, it so it I would say while certainly I'm. I'm sorry, they're announced. I'm in the hospital, so they're announcing about a flu. That's all right. Um, but That's great. Um, with, um, yeah, it's authentic. <laughs> so, uh, um, all, all I was saying was that this is not a memoir. I, while I'm certainly uh, sprinkled through the book, 
uh, and in some of my own injuries and my own <laughs> issues, uh, <laughs> focus really about the field of trauma and what trauma surgeons do and how we uh, interface with the public. Yeah. And that's something that everybody knows about this much. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the, the rest of it is this much, this much, this big. Um, and of course, it's how many times have people stopped you and asked you, well, exactly what do you do, Dr. Cohn? Well, so frequently that my wife got on me to go ahead and write this book because <laughs> it, 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 it's a, a regular occurrence. And, uh, and I have, I find that I, you know, I've been teaching uh, residents and medical students for uh, many, many decades, and I use stories to underscore some important uh, point I'm trying to make. And so I, after a while, just like in any field, you start to collect these stories in your head. That's what made it relatively straightforward to write down because they were all just sort of sitting there trying to get out anyway. And I just gave them a an avenue. Right. So. Good. Uh, you're going to be very glad you did, uh, my opinion. Um, Thank you. I, I looked at the, the, the lead in paragraph and I, and, and I marked and underlined and underlined uh, the last sentence. And I guess we're you're deciding and seeing and describing. We are a glue people helping to hold together the entire hospital enterprise. What do you think about that? Well, this is my attempt to try to make it understandable what exactly a, a surgeon who is in our role sort of occupies. So essentially, sometimes in the hospital, something goes wrong. And it could go wrong in terms of a breathing tube in the medical intensive care unit or a in the uh, labor and delivery uh, after a baby's delivered where someone begins to bleed to death um, or a variety of other circumstances where just things kind of go haywire. Someone needs to be able to respond to that. And in many hospitals and in, certainly in trauma centers, that those people are the trauma surgeons. We're general surgeons who uh, sort of specialize in catastrophe. And so if you get run over by a bus, or you're in the medical ICU and start to bleed to death, or you're, uh, um, you know, you have a difficult problem somewhere in the hospital, we respond. We also do general surgery, such as appendicitis and taking out gallbladders and deal with people with the bowel obstructions or bleeding, and also manage the ICU. So we're critical care doctors. And that's kind of what we do, we, we do medical school for four years and then five years of residency. And then most of, uh, typically we'll do a year of what's called a crit trauma critical care fellowship or surgical critical care fellowship. And at the end of that, then we can really start learning. Uh, after that, we uh, um, uh, go generally to uh, some center that ha takes care of trauma patients and general surgical patients. Well, um, there's a description here, and I'm referring to you, I believe. They are also a steely quarterback who can't be rattled when they throw an interception. Lingering on a past failure would only ruin their ability to care for the next patient and the next. That's right. I, so you're, I played, you're... Go ahead. Go ahead. I had peewee football when I was growing up. Uh, so I'm in high school. Uh, but can't even get past 145 pounds then. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, uh, you're a little light. Uh, yeah, to, I'm a to little light. A little light. Um, well, it, you know, we all realize that, you know, I mean, heck, it's football season, right? You have to yeah. stand in there and, and uh, weather the storm. And uh, uh, sometimes you're going to make an error as the quarterback. But when you're quarterback the trauma team, uh, you have to have a small rear view mirror. Uh, you, you have to learn from your errors and judgment and move ahead because the, there's a torrent of trauma patients that are coming in. And sometimes they're coming in multiple, you know, two, three times at the same time. Recently, uh, 
one of my partners called me in as backup. You know, we always have in trauma centers, you always have the person who's in the hospital. And then the person we're talking attending now, you know, a faculty member, someone at home. And uh, I was called because two people came in at the same exact time and both had to go to the operating room and they both had the exact same injury. And we couldn't really figure it out until later. It turned out that they were both riding on a moped that and someone had shot at them and one bullet went through both of them in exactly really? the same area. And they both wow. did fine, uh, you know, ultimately, ultimately did fine. But uh, uh, but sometimes you have more than one person can handle. But usually it's staggered. So, you know, you have one injured person and then one other disaster and they kind of come in at, in a way that one person can deal with them serially. At what point did you and the other uh, doc put your ears together and, and to see about what happened? What did he, what happened? What happened? What happened? Right. Well, uh, well, in this particular case, it was the next morning at our kind of checkout. Uh, then it became uh -huh. after talking to the police and that kind of thing, what, what had happened. But usually we don't really know. I and see. we actually, and most of the time we stop asking because it's, it's either a nonsense story or, you know, uh, that, you know, someone was, you know, uh, uh, crashed their motorcycle, intoxicated, you know, leaving Bible studies. I mean, the studies don't, the, the stories don't necessarily line up with anything uh, believable anyway. So we just take them as they come. Yeah, there's one item on here uh, that I thought that was interesting to me. It was when I had a knee replacement. And um, the point here is what really goes on in an operating room? And this was a large hospital in Denver, Colorado. And um, they that's, they all said, this is where you need to be. And even my uh, uh, person that was tending to me with with exercises and so forth, finally I said, I can't do it anymore. It's just too, too hard. It, it hurts too much. And um, she, she, I, she, I gave her permission to come in as well as other people there. Uh, apparently, I was one of the few that had done it, and this was 50, 15 years ago. And uh, it's it's working for me now. You know, I'm, I'm glad of that. Um, it was a uh, operating room. Once once they zipped me with the, with the you know I was out. You know I don't know what I'm, you're wrong guy to ask what it's about. <laughs> if you're flat on your back, you know. It's a you really have to have the confidence in the the operating surgeon and the team because obviously none of us when we're under anesthesia can have much impact on the on the uh circumstance you know yes. it's just uh, it's a little a little late in the game yeah a little late now one more here was a dot I, I made on the first page um and i think you've touched on it a little bit uh, how do trauma surgeons stay cool and act decisively when a patient's life hangs in a balance? And I thought if it was football, there was too much yelling. Is that going to help me? No. Um, so probably a lot of things. Uh, what do you think about that statement? Well, the, it, it's sort of a... Um... Let's say if you're someone who becomes an anxious under stress, mm -hmm. then you're, as a medical student or as a surgical resident, you're not going to gravitate to that stress level of stress. Um, you know, uh, some people are very stressed when uh, everything's very quiet and methodical, and other people are stressed when um, all hell breaks loose. Um, uh, those individuals that don't like uh, chaos, they're not going to be trauma surgeons because almost by definition, there's a certain amount of chaos. We're sort of the, uh, without being theatrical, we're sort of the, you know, all hell's breaking loose and we're the calm person standing there trying to make sense out of it and find, you know, uh, you know, put our thumb in the dike or, uh, you know, uh, stop the torrent. And um, so... Uh, there's sort of a, um, 
self-determination where people that uh, this kind of environment makes them uncomfortable, they don't do it. And those of us that sort of thrive on a little bit of challenge, because uh, uh, it is challenging, no question, mm -hmm. uh, trying to you know sort out things when there's sort of an uncontrolled environment, we, uh, we stay in that field. And then over time, you become you realize the value of, of a very calm, quiet environment. So typically it doesn't matter all that much if someone is not badly hurt, if, if the place is a little noisy and people are a little chatty. But when someone's really sick and dying, everybody gets right. very quiet and calm because they follow the, the leader. And if the leader stays calm, whether it's in the uh, emergency department trauma center or up in the operating room, you know, you, calmness sets the, of the leader sets the tone for the entire group because everybody's really got to function sort of in a uh, organized symphony to get some of these patients uh, to su survive. Right. It's got to be done right. right. I, I see that part. Uh, you know, I was, we were talking about how people start uh, freaking out and, uh, um, I would, uh, having been in the army in, in a war, it was for me, I wasn't particularly one, wanting to do this, but I knew I had to do it. And so we, when we parked the car and I started walking towards the hospital, that's when I had that, that, that view, what was going to happen, what was going to happen. And uh, you got to get it in your head to get it right. I think my head, patient's yeah. head. <laughs> and, yeah. and you have that probably part of it as well on your agenda, wherever you uh, admit them. You know, one of the challenges, I mean, you mentioned, I'm just going to follow on, you mentioned the patient, you know, and their state of mind. Unfortunately, if you roll your car or fall from a height at a workplace, you don't really choose your surgeon. You know, when you get your knee replaced, like you had your knee replaced, you could go meet with the surgeon, you could talk to the team, you could look at the hospital setting and decide that was right for you. But when it's something that's sort of foisted upon you, like you roll into the trauma center, maybe unconscious, and you wake up in the ICU, you and your family, they really didn't choose the, the faculty. They didn't choose the, the surgeon. So there's a certain kind of a need for a building of trust and confidence. Mm -hmm. right. And that's, that's very challenging to us. Uh, the ICU is a real a uh, real challenge because our patients are there and they're really sick and sometimes, you know, a uh, very complicated situation and they didn't prepare for it. Patients and their families didn't prepare for it. You know? I see. I see. Yeah, there was another sentence here that I want to read back to you. Uh, the book will interest everyone who enjoys fast-paced stories of surgical Daring do told in the context of the complex social and political questions of the do of the day. So, as you're on your way to what, washing your hands, um, did somebody ask you, "Did Biden do a good job today?" No, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the political no. So, the social and political thing. What that is referring to is that. While a lot has improved over the last 40 years that I've been doing this, mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, Pre-hospital care is much better. Uh, you know, our, our paramedics, our, our, our ambulances, our helicopter services, we practice a higher quality care with science-based uh, medicine and surgery. Uh, our ICU care is much better. All those things have certainly improved. What is still the same is the same number of knucklehead, uh, uh, trauma cases that are coming in uh, because we, uh, you know, in many cases haven't as a society decided that, you know, certain things aren't going to happen anymore, uh, like drinking and driving or, uh, you know, some of the kinds of injuries that we see, like uh, drive, riding a motorcycle with no helmet on or, um, uh, you know, and, and I'm not even going to get into uh, the issues that we have with you know, high velocity weapons and high magazine weapons, things like that, that we don't even know what the impact of different things are because we were prohibited 
from doing research in the in the subject for 25 years at right. the federal level. Right. But but it's it's like Groundhog Day. So uh, I think there there are things that we can do as a society that you know to pre to prevent injury, and that's one of our big goals in every trauma center and all trauma surgeons is we'd rather we didn't have to take care of you all mangled up. You know, I understand. I understand. There was one other comment here. I liked, uh, let's see. All bleeding stops is a riveting fun and deeply insightful read that will keep you on the edge of your seat. How do you like that? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to buy one. I read but that. Someone... I'm going to buy one. <laughs> well, <clears throat> obviously, I didn't write that, but someone, uh, someone uh, uh, must have enjoyed it. I'm glad to hear some reviewer thought that was a good book. Yeah, part of it. <laughs> um, I... Go ahead. No, I was going to say I, 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 I'm always glad when someone likes it. One of the problems is that uh, obviously you. It's hard to know when your friends read your book because they hear your voice when they're reading it. They, obviously, they're your friend because they enjoy talking to you or they right. like your sense of humor. It's more when someone who has no idea of your style or or your sense of humor enjoys it. So that's to me the ultimate test was going to be when people that don't know me read the book and whether or not they really enjoy it. Well, you're probably be getting a lot of letters. I uh, direct them to the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. That's right. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it struck me with that. Um, my, my family, my father, my mother, uh, everybody was okay. Had a long life. Uh, some of the other parts of the, uh, their, their direct people, uh, for instance, my dad had uh, 10 or 11 brothers and sisters. And my mother had seven or eight brothers and sisters. Um, and there's all kinds of uh, people that come from the same family. They're st still slightly different. And uh, it would be the same thing in, tr in trying to get someone to, to look at what you're focusing on. And I'm sure you do that yourself. So, uh, John, explain that to me exactly again, what, what your question is. Well, I was thinking in terms of, like, you've seen this before. When you come yeah. in, on, in on something, this is ha this, it's what the switch goes on. And, and you know what that is. Whereas other people that don't have the, the observation of everything for decades, Mm -hmm. uh, they're not playing along in that respect, and they probably create some problems. You're, you're basically, I think, asking me about how experience impacts on patient care. Is that is that what you're yes, alluding to? Yes. And that's yeah. part of it, right? So there's there's no question that you know what we're uh, what we're searching to do, what we're trying to attain in our educational process is to graduate a, a, a surgical resident who is prepared to independently take care of uh, the populace, right? We want them to be safe, number one, and have good judgment, you know, the judgment of who to operate on and what to do. Uh, it's not really, uh, there's a misconception on the part of the public. I think that, you know, there's this huge difference in surgical skills, like, you know, one person can sew in a, Bas uh, you know, a vascular graph better than the next person. Well, there, there is a small subset of people that are truly geniuses with their hands. Mm -hmm. um, that in general, that's irrelevant, okay, w with few exceptions. And then there's the 90% of people that are solid and a few percent that, you know, can't, so, can't uh, tie their shoelaces, you know, they have Velcro. Um, but the the real the real challenge that makes a, a surgeon excellent or not is knowing who to operate on and what to do, and that's what we spend five years training people, and at the end of that time, 
95, 90, 95 percent of American surgical residents do a fellowship year or two to get even more experience. And then most of them go into practice in an environment where there are people that they can bounce things off of, come look at their case, that kind of thing. So, you know, over time, less and less limitations. You have less and less restrictions that you impose on yourself because you know your comfort zone improves. Right. You know, I've trained maybe 150 fellows and they're excellent to a, to a person. And once in a while, I'll get a call, usually in the first couple of years after they're out of fellowship, from one of them to ask me a question about how to manage something. But those questions become less and less as they get older and older. And then, of course, a couple of years down the line, they're training their own fellows and they have their own residents. And, you know, it, it uh, it's very much a family. But, you know, we're, our, our objective is to make it so that a lot of that experience that I have, I relate it to people that are more junior to me to keep them out of trouble. And then that gets handed on down. So. Right. Um, so it's not sort of a trial and error experience. I got it. And I hope they get it when they come out and want to be. <laughs> you. <right>. Exactly. <laughs> uh, let me close with uh, a statement I found here. A new truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents, but rather because they eventually die. <laughs> well, that's a little tongue in cheek. But yeah. it, 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 that was related to the section that I wrote on, on dogma and how yeah. that's really the enemy. I have a whole talk on this. That's really the enemy uh, of people in medicine and, and certainly surgeons because, you know, we're trained one way and the world changes. And now you start looking when you're 20 years down the line, let's say, you start looking at things that you were trained to do 20 years ago and that you've been training people to do for the last 20 years that are now the opposite of the way that we need to do it because we've got good science. So, you know, surgeons have to be conservative, but they also have to change with the times. So uh, un unfortunately, sometimes that requires them to die off for things to change. I think that's the word that they used. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much. And I want you to tell me where my audience can find the book, your book, it's coming out on the 5th. On the 5th of December, yes. All, all Bleeding Stops. So uh, I know it's on Amazon and uh, uh, Barnes and Noble's uh, right. websites. I, I don't, I'm sure it, it, there are other places, but those are the mm -hmm. two that come immediately to mind. And hopefully it'll be in some bookstores and libraries. But uh, that's, that's wishful thinking. As I read here, it's All Bleeding Stops colon, life and death in the trauma unit. That's the whole book title. The whole book should, title. The whole book title. <laughs> you should be very proud of this book. Thank and, you, uh, I'm going to buy it. No. I want to, uh, let's see, thank you for coming in, coming on. Thank and, you for having me. Um, um, I'm going to thank my um audience, my listeners, for tuning in to Searching for Integrity, and uh, so long, and happy trails to all. Happy trails to you. Thanks. When we meet again. When we meet again. You That's... and uh, Dean Autry or Roy Rogers. Roy Rogers, you got it. Exactly. <laughs>